Uh, David, last time we um, heard Paul sort of announcing some themes that he wanted to pursue uh, at the end of chapter 3. He was talking about, in his prayerful way, um, uh, strengthening the community and holiness and blamelessness before God. And right. that seems to be theme one of chapter four. Right. And then talking about the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints as theme two. Yeah. So mm, what about theme one, uh, holiness and blamelessness? What's Paul's concern here at the beginning of chapter four? Well, there, there are really two concerns he has about the holiness and blamelessness. The first one has to do with sexual immorality. And precisely what's at stake, I think, is hard to figure out. He, he, he says he somehow brings this as a word through the Lord Jesus in, chapter, in verse 2 of chapter 4, whether that means he knows a saying of Jesus we don't know, knows a saying of Jesus we do know, or that this is something that the risen Lord has inspired him to say we just have no way of knowing. But the will is that you abstain from, sanct from fornication. That seems fairly clear, though the, the word for fornication is a little... Um, can be can be applied in a in a broad variety of ways, but the tricky verse for me, at least, and I love your wisdom on this too, is is verse four that each one of you know how to control your own body, which all also could mean that just the words are unclear. The Greek words are unclear in their translation. That each one of you knows how to hold fast to your own wife, mm -hmm. um, and it's not the options that are suggested are various, but one possibility is that that it's a matter of. Um, uh, on the one hand, not using sexuality within marriage in, an, in a kind of um, uh, date rape way that you that you that marriage be a matter of mutual consent. And so that you treat your own spouse lovingly uh, in marriage by treating your own body as a, as a vessel of God's goodness and as a kind of uh, instrument of fornication. Or the other possibility is that, that you find for yourself a wife so that this is a little bit what we get other, elsewhere in, in uh, Paul, especially in 1 Corinthians, so that instead of uh, you falling uh, um, into kind of lustful extramarital relations that you tame your own sexuality by finding for yourself a wife. And I think mm -hmm. either of those is possible and neither of those is clear to me. You got any clear sense on that? Uh, I don't have a, uh, an absolute solution yeah, to yeah. it. I have some ideas. Okay. Uh, the word in verse 4 for yeah. body yeah. is yeah. Uh, skewos, skewos yeah. which means vessel. Yeah. Uh, it refers to a vase yeah. or a pot yeah. or something. Uh, so it's uh, Paul using metaphorical language again right. that, uh, that probably uh, resonated with his uh, his uh, addressees in a way that it uh, it doesn't quite yeah, with yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And as you say, there are different ways of unpacking the metaphor. It could be use yourself, your own yeah. body, in a certain way, or use um, uh, the the person with whom you have a sexual yeah. relationship in a certain yeah. way. Uh, I think it's probably clear enough what he means by fornication, yeah. uh, that is, uh, sexual ac activity outside, outside of, of marriage. marriage. Right, 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 right. Um, I think he believes in, in marriage as the place where uh, sexual activity should Absolutely. take place. Uh, I think what he, he is getting at, whether he's referring to oneself or one's partner um, in this uh, admonition here, uh, is kind of clarified by verse 5. Uh, at the end of verse 4, he talks about holiness and honor. Right. And then the unpacking uh, comes in verse 5, not with lustful passion like the Gentiles who do not know God, that no one wrong or exploit a brother or sister. Yeah. Uh, I think that's, uh, that's the heart of his message here, uh, that uh, uh, the sexual relationship should not be one Exploited. of exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I think what he might have in mind of various kinds of sexual relations between um, masters and slaves, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. or um, men and boys, yeah. uh, all of which would be exploitative, and yeah. also would be condemned by most ancient yeah, moralists, fair enough. right? Yeah, yep. uh, with varying degrees of, of uh, passion and conviction. So uh, one of our uh, colleagues uh, here at, at Yale has, has written on sexual morality with a a book entitled Just Love. Right. And uh, I think she gets uh, the point here, or the point that she makes about yeah. uh, Christian sexual morality is the point that's at the heart of Paul's admonition in verse uh, verses six and, uh, in verse six in particular, uh, the business that love should not be exploitative. Exploitative of anyone, yeah. 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 It should be just. No, that's very helpful. Just two other things that strike me about it. Uh, the first is that he says not to behave like the Gentiles, though most of them probably were Gentiles. And it's an interesting way in which it's so many places in the New Testament, you were Gentiles, but you're not Gentiles, even though you are Gentiles. You're not part of this new community. So that they are called in some ways into the holiness of Israel. 
though uh, historically they may be Gentiles. And the other, the reminder that God will avenge all this, and we're going to get that in, in, as we go along, as we look at the end of chapter 4 and chapter 5, at the way in which God comes um, in judgment at the end. But I think that's very helpful. Yeah, I, I take your point, and I think it's worth stressing, uh, that Paul has the notion that uh, this new community, the body of Christ, yeah. Yeah, and he talks about this in, uh, with the language of, of uh, grafting yeah. in uh, Romans. Yeah. Uh, it is uh, a community that's uh, in continuity with, with and in Israel. fact is yeah. the fulfillment of uh, God's expectations yeah. for yeah. Israel. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. This is now the holy people. Right. doesn't mean Israel's not still holy. No. That's much disputed about what he means by that, but there, it's, it's holy also. Well, then the, the part two is that is now we've had the purity, now we have the question of the love. Um, and the love, once again, is he, he can, commends them for being loving both of each other and loving the church all throughout Macedonia, which I think means partly, again, that they've been um, instrumental in the spread of the gospel. But this uh, odd verse in terms of we try to live quietly to mind our own affairs and to work with our own hands as we directed you. The working with his own hands is, a, is part of what he's proud of in terms of his own apostleship. He's concerned that they work with their own hands. Um, and, and what exactly is at stake is not clear to me. Is there some kind of undue dependence on the part of some Christians uh, that, who are simply uh, waiting and exploiting and the fact that they're in this loving community and saying, all right, I'm, I'm in, the, in the business of receiving and not of giving? Um, is it some kind of misunderstanding of the end of time that they think somehow there's nothing to be done before Christ comes again? That's not explicit here at any point. Or what Clearly, there's a strong sense that faithfully to be Christian is to uh, pull your own oar, become part of the community, and do your own responsibilities within the community. Yeah. Now, some people have um, made a connection between uh, First Thessalonians and Second Thessalonians right. on this point, right. and have seen this uh, uh, unwillingness to work yeah. to be a reaction to their eschatological right. hope. Right. Uh, do you think? I don't that see that you know, here. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that this is more. But I think we have, we're not clear at all what the motivation is, but there seems to be some sense uh, that some are not fully participating in taking their own responsibility in terms of the community. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, holiness and blamelessness has to do with uh, sexual morality, sexual morality and also and with uh, participating communal participation. in, in yeah. the life of the community. Yeah. Yeah. That's part one. Part That's two, part one. Um, Paul starts reflecting on the eschatological issue and what is the issue and how does Paul yeah. deal with it? Um, the issue seems to be that... Uh, the Thessalonians seem to be surprised by the fact that some of their fellow believers have died before Christ returned. Now, we said in our very first discussion that, that Paul almost certainly believed, at this point in his ministry at least, that Jesus would come before he, Paul, died. And it seems likely that the Thessalonians also thought that Christ would come before many of them died. And now they have been uh, passing away. Christians have been passing away in the community. The issue doesn't seem to be, I'm, I'm, I'd love to get your reflection on this. The issue doesn't seem to be the question of whether the dead will be raised so much as to whether they will have their right place in the order of resurrection. Are they going to be um, the last to be brought along or is there some sense in which they can fully participate in all the glory of Christ's return? Um, and so uh, his, his concern, as he says, and then his comfort is, this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left until the coming of the Lord, will by no means precede those who have died. And the question of precedent seems to be extremely important when he does this kind of scenario of what the end of time will look like. So the revered elders of the community will have their proper they, place they, in the procession. They get to have the facing, they have, they have the, the elders' benches, right? Mm -hmm, They're mm -hmm. first, first in the new community as well. Mm -hmm. What's the image here of, uh, that, that Paul is sketching of, of the second coming? Yeah, well, it draws very much on, on uh, literature we have elsewhere in the New Testament and in literature of the same time um, about a kind of a triumphant uh, procession led by uh, Jesus uh, with the sound of the trumpet and uh, and bringing the others into resurrection, um, then we will be caught. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up in the clouds together with them to meet the Lord in the air, with the angels to meet the Lord in the air, with the saints to meet the Lord in the air. I'm sorry, and we will all be with the Lord forever. Um, a strong emphasis in a lot of American popular Christianity about kind of the rapture, that the that the faithful get carried away and the rest get left behind. My sense of this is it's quite the opposite, that, it, that Christ is coming now to establish Christ's kingdom on earth, that we go up into the air not to be whisked off to some ethereal realm, but to lead the triumphal procession uh, where he becomes king of heaven and of earth. 
and that uh, the, what we want to make sure is that the elders get a chance to be part of the parade. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember um, teaching in a um, uh, New Testament course here at one point and um, having a conversation about First Thessalonians and telling my students uh, there is no doctrine of the rapture in First Thessalonians. In fact, there's no doctrine of the rapture anywhere, any place anywhere. in the New Testament. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah, and yeah. Many of them were very surprised. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's, exactly. Some, so, some of them also wondered, what's the doctrine of the rapture? <laughs> yes, uh, but right. It, Life at Yale, right? Yes. <laughs> But the, um, the language of the rapture is, is uh, derived from this particular verse, right? Caught up. Caught up. In the air. Oh, the caught up in the air. Yep. And then, and then as, as if that's the first catching up on the way to the further catching up. Right. And I sus my strong suspicion is it goes the other way. Yeah. Is... This looks like the end time scenario. This looks like the end time scenario. The doctrine of the rapture right. assumes that that's something that takes place before eschatological exactly. tribulation. Right. Exactly. Kind of reading this text yeah. in connection with the book of Revelation, doesn't work. they're really yeah. doesn't you know, work. operating exactly with different, right. uh, yeah. different yeah. scenarios. That's exactly right. Yeah. But, but I think what one does have to see here, um, and, and that I think for contemporary Christians of, of my ilk, at least sometimes hard, is that Paul absolutely presupposes uh, the claim that there will be a coming of Christ, that that will be triumphant, that the kingdom is yet to come, that we don't yet have all that we're going to get. As, and so that faith and love are terrific, but you also have to have hope. Now, what, what do you make of that as a 20th century pastor and preacher? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's it's, it's uh, not a doctrine that sits... Uh, no, it's not. A, it's, uh, um, easy and I've, I, I, as, a, as a preacher, I've wrestled with that probably more than any other theological problem because I don't think you can just omit it um, I don't think you can do what some really distinguished theologians have tried to do, which is to say, well, it's just a mythological way of talking about being, having a good full life right now. And this is, my full life is its own manifestation of Christ's coming. That is eschatological existence. Um, so I, I'm better at my puzzlement than at my solution. Um, my, my solution, which is not a solution, is to claim that God is not just the God of personal lives, but of history. And that unless there's some way in which we can claim God's activity in the way the world works, not just the way my life works, we undervalue the, the New Testament. And the claim that, um, that we move toward God, that, that whatever we are doing as individuals and as church and as, as history brings us finally into the fullness of who God is, not just our own best efforts. Mm -hmm. And that's as far as I've gotten after mm -hmm. lots of years of trying to get somewhere. <laughs> hmm. I, I sympathize with that, and um, I'm not sure I'd express it in precisely the same way, but I, I think there has to be room for, um, uh, for hope in, yeah. uh, in um, Christian life and in Christian teaching. And the way we express our hope is going to, uh, for a fulfillment beyond our own yeah. individual yeah. lives yeah. Um, is going to be shaped by our own understanding of cosmology and, um, and the world as we know it. Uh, and it's a lot bigger a world than It's uh, a much bigger world, Paul right, thought. right. Right, um, but this—it's um, a world too, and uh, that's grounded in a God who. It's, it's got to be God's who, world still. Right. Who can pull us beyond where yep. we are? Yep, all that. And so Paul's uh, imagery here, derived from the political circumstances of his day, yep. is stuff that we can't quite relate to. Right. But uh, the hope, I think, is something I that we have hope to. Hope is huge, yeah. and it's hope for you and me, but also hope for our world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Encourage one another with these words. Encourage one another with these words. Still try. I think I what still we need try. to do. Yeah, yep. absolutely.